Welcome to the Connectors Podcast, the show that explores the importance of making meaningful connections for personal and professional growth and happiness. We will share how building and recognizing strong connections in life can help you achieve your goals, find fulfillment in your work, and how you can create opportunities to build a purposeful and meaningful future. So I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Nadia Jiksenbayeva, who is a renowned scientist, entrepreneur, and award-winning author. As the co-founder and chief reinvention officer of We Exist Reinvention Agency and founder of the Reinvention Academy, she's a trusted advisor to Fortune 500 and private companies. She's a sought-after TEDx speaker, known as the Queen of Reinvention, and has helped companies like Coca-Cola, IBM, and L'Oreal reinvent their products and business models. Born in Kazakhstan during the Soviet Union's dissolution, she learned firsthand the power of reinvention and has since dedicated herself to helping organizations navigate change successfully. Thank you for joining us today, Nadia. Welcome, Nadia. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're excited to have you. And just want to let our audience know, we we have talked about reinvention many times on this show, and we feel like you are our connection catalyst, truly, when it comes to why we were here and how we ended up here in the first place, Quentin and I, um, because we both took programs under your the Reinvention Academy. And um, through that through the program, through the community. That's how we were connected and started this podcast. So thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> we appreciate <Yay>. it. <laughs> it's an honor of my life, right? Because yeah, the essence, I think, of surviving and thriving in our turbulent times is the connection. I think what pulls us through and gives us resources and gives us ear to the ground is the connection that we have with other people and also with nature, with the world beyond. So I appreciate seeing the successes of our programs show up also in relationships. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And it's been an amazing journey. I, I actually have said to multiple people, I said, it's so strange for me to think a year ago, I was just finishing up the program in the summer, the CRA pro or CRP program. And then, you know, to be watching you on camera and listening to you in the reinvention labs and going through the whole process. I was like, this woman is amazing. This program is amazing. I love this community. And to think if I was to try to think in the future that you would be on the podcast that I didn't even start at that point yet, (laughs) I wouldn't have believed it. (laughs) So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. (laughs) Many, many cycles of reinvention. (laughs) As it Mm -hmm. be, I think this is the permission we give to ourselves to let go and try something new. And you guys are now on your 20th episode and it mm-hmm. takes such a persistence and um, dedication there's a reason why i don't have a podcast i know how much work goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> episode 20 this is a huge victory thank you Thank you. We, I think we, we've achieved it because we've split up the jobs and we've chosen things that we like to do and we've accepted one or two things that we've just got to get done and we've just got in there and done it really mm-hmm. but clearly we are lovers of the reinvention method we've taken the reinvention labs mm-hmm. we've i've got the cra which is certified reinvention associates and jolyn has gone a step above me to the crp the certified reinvention practitioner so we clearly love the program and what you are all about but tell our listeners why should they care about reinvention and what can they get to benefit from it? Well, I'm biased, right? This is not a neutral <laughs> question for me. So whoever is listening, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the reason why this uh, movement was born and this toolkit was developed is because as a scientist and as an executive on the ground, I had the luxury of not only starting my own businesses, but also working in a massive mining enterprise. As both the academic and the practitioner, I saw the huge, huge gap we have in the world right now between the reality we face 
fast moving, constantly disrupted, turbulent world. But the tools we're using, the tools we're learning in school, then in the university, and then as managers in business, are designed for a stable world. They're designed during 20th century, right post-war period, where the world mm-hmm. was the most stable and most predictable and most certain. So there's a mismatch between the reality on the ground and the tools we're learning and then trying to apply in the daily life, whether it's strategy tools, um, HR tools, operations tools, supply chain management tools, um, leadership tools, really doesn't matter. The essence is the same. And that's why the movement was born, is to close the gap between the needs of a permanently turbulent world and the realities uh, we are facing uh, in an mm. academic environment. We need to marry the two worlds together and we need to update our toolkits. And before that, we need to update our mindset. Mm-hmm. And in terms of, I guess, mindset, when you talk about the reinvi- reinvention mindset, and I know how you've expressed and shared that before, but if you could share with our listeners, what do you think the reinvent or what do you feel the reinvention mindset is? Mm-hmm. Well, um, any kind of mindset is a set of beliefs we have about a thing. And reinvention mindset is a set of beliefs about what change is and everything around change. So my strong conviction, first of all, as a scientist and second as a mother, that we are born naturally good at change. If you look at a healthy, normal baby, we change naturally every day. And this is our factory setting, if you will. This is how we come in. You don't need to offer a baby a bonus to start walking. And (laughs) you see a baby trying to walk for 100 times, falling miserably and crying and then sitting there and saying, you know, this walking thing is just not for me. I'm I'm, I'm not. (laughs) It doesn't happen. We reinvent and reinvent relentlessly and endlessly, but we are educated out of it. And why that is happening is no conspiracy theory. It's just a period of time in the last couple of centuries where the assumption was that change is bad, uh, stability is good. And based on that assumption, the way we educate our kids, the way we run our businesses, the way we run our governments is all about stability is good and change is bad. Hmm. Change is not good or bad. (laughs) It's a neutral reality. And what happened is that when you think change is bad, and second, if you think, when you think change is rare, you make different decisions in your life than if you think change is neutral or possibly even positive, it's an opportunity. And if you think change is uh, not rare, but extremely, extremely frequent, you will make different decisions. It's the same as if you live in Florida and it snows once in a hundred years, you will make different decisions about snow than when you live in you guys' neighborhood and uh, <laughs> uh, in Canada where it snow is, you know. Every snow day. tires are mandatory. <laughs> so you will have snow tires. You will know how to drive differently in snow. You will have clothes that is appropriate for the weather. You will allocate resources to shovels and salt and whatever else that Floridians would not. So Hmm. our set of beliefs drives our behaviors. And what we see is that because most of the world is stuck in the assumption that change is rare and change is bad, they're still holding on to the hope that one day soon, the period of disruption and turbulence we have been experiencing nonstop since the beginning of the century. Guys, it's 23 years. And if you even forget the first few years and say, okay, it's since the last recession. Since the last recession, it's been 15 years. But we are still waiting for things to go back to normal. We're still mm-hmm. hoping we will go back to business as usual with no signs of that ever coming back. So Mm. the mindset makes us then make different decisions. If you understand that change is often, and if you understand that change can be an incredible opportunity, you will start allocating your time differently. For example, this year, PwC's survey, which is the CEO report, over 4,000 CEOs report to PricewaterhouseCoopers, what's their priority? Their number one time priority is reinvention. 47% of their time goes to reinvention, but they actually prefer 
to up it to 57%. And if you look at money, right now, over 50%, actually over 60% of all investment dollars, yens and euros, are going to reinvention, not to preserving the status quo. So you will spend money differently. You will spend your time differently. You will create processes that you didn't have before, but it starts with the basic assumptions first. When you're working with these for- Fortune 500 companies, with CEOs, with people who have this resistance to change, how do you approach that? And, and does it depend? Obviously, there's a lot of factors at play. It's going to depend on the size of the company, the type of teams that they have there, um, their infrastructure, all those things. But how, how do you approach that when people have real resistance to change and reinvention? Well, I see resistance to change as a absolutely my friend, uh, for me to sign of a healthy immune system. If a random person walks into your company and says, it's time to change, and everyone says, yes, let's do it. <laughs> me, that's actually a sign of something horrible going on. You right. need to have a pushback. It's the same as if something comes into my body, my body checks out. Uh, is it a safe thing? This molecule that just showed up? Is it a piece of, um, I don't know, apple or is it a virus? That's very natural for the immune system to, you know, have its signals up and sniff around and not be all welcoming. So I look at resistance to change as a sign of super healthy immunity. And actually, when I don't see a push up back, we create artificial fire to create that kind of warm up in a sense. Let's be engaged. Let's be actually choosing and then healthy normal environment has a mm-hmm. population of employees who are saying no who are saying this is not for me that's the starting point the second thing we use neuroscience to reverse the relationship with change there's plenty of data and there's excellent exercises now to help companies bring their employees back to their factory settings where change was a natural for us, where we were reinventing five times a day as babies and bring back that capacity and essentially reawaken it. It's not that we don't know how to do it, it's that we learn to associate it with loss, with fear, with, uh, you know, my job is not going to be better or I will lose a job or whatever else. Then, of course, the most important thing right now is to go from thinking that reinvention is a one-time project to understanding reinvention as a process, as a repetitive process, and build a system of reinvention that is no longer reactive to a disturbance or disruption, but proactive in its nature. Reactive means the new technology shows up, let's say AI, or a new competitor shows up, or new regulation shows up, and everyone is, oh my God, oh my God, what are we going to do about it? Proactive is we have a process that scans and anticipates change and ahead of time produces ideas, strategies, approaches on how to turn that change into opportunity or at least neutralize its risks and implement necessary changes in the organization proactively before it becomes a problem. So going from change as a project to change as a process is very crucial for us. And I always uh, compare that to a very simple metaphor. Uh, It's like taking a shower. If I don't take a shower on a regular basis, I begin to stink. So in the current turbulent, fast-moving environment, if you don't take a shower for your products, for your services, for your business processes, for your leadership practices, if you don't wash them off on a regular basis, you begin to stink. So it needs to be a regular heartbeat, not every second, but also not every 10 years. There is an optimal heartbeat for every organization, for every industry, and it's your job to develop that heartbeat for yourself. Mm-hmm. I think that's so true when you're saying it's it's your job to develop the heartbeat for yourself. Because if I think back to when I did my first reinvention lab, which I think was three years ago in the pandemic, like many people, I was like, oh, Lordy, here we go. <laughs> I started studying a second master's degree. I needed something to, to keep me energized. And I did the lab and I loved it. And I did a few exercises for weeks after. And then it went. 
And then I, I saw another lab coming up. I was like, okay, I've got to get back on the bandwagon. The train has pulled up to the station. Let me get in and let me do another lab. That one was more successful. And then I had the opportunity to do the CRA and I took that and I did the CRA and now I'm working with reinvention Canada on some things and we're even using some of the reinvention tools and frameworks like the Stellar that's our process oh, yeah. Stellar that's processes our way of, every day yeah, yeah we do it as our project management every mm -hmm. four months we sit down and we have a big review and it teaches us what where we've got to check out for the future what our limits are what our strengths are where we need to shift and adjust mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. it's an awesome tool and just so we don't leave our oh sorry <laughs> So we don't leave our listeners in the dark on what the Stellar tool is. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Of course. And yeah. by the way, we'll provide a link for a free download. It's yeah, a great. page preview of our latest book, the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook on How to Thrive in Chaos. And Stellar is the last section. So if you guys are flipping through, it's the last section. And uh, Stellar Agile Strategy Canvas showed up when I was working with a massive manufacturing company that just launched a corporate venture capital fund. And uh, you can imagine this very... Mm archaic, traditional, hierarchical organization trying to manage a bunch of startups in a traditional way it just didn't work. So they needed a tool that would combine discipline with flexibility. And most planning tools don't do that. And that's how Stella was born with few elements that add to this amazing flexibility that built flexibility in without losing discipline around limits, around setting goals mm -hmm. and so on. And that's what Stellar is. So you guys download, check it out. I always say, first time you see it, you will think, oh my God, this is complicated. Uh, oh my God, I'm lost and so on. Apply it to something super easy, like reinventing your weekends or reinventing. I always share example of how I got myself to sleep more because I was chronically under sleeping and I just used it to plan out how I will slowly teach myself to sleep more. Apply to something super simple, trivial, and then go to the business agenda. Mm -hmm. And these tools can be used in a personal aspect and in a professional aspect. I know for myself, when I took the program, the CRP program, I did my reinvention, um, I guess, final presentation on a personal reinvention story. And it was how I sort of reinvented myself through divorce. And it actually was a very therapeutic process to go through to do that. And at the end of it, I, I felt just this, you know, immense co accomplishment and relief. And then I also was able to see, oh, I can apply this in so many different ways. So I love that it is, an, uh, you have that ability to look at it from a multitude of levels and try it and test it. And that ex that experimental learning is always at the core of it. Um, and something Quentin and I noticed even with the podcast, if even though we have our plans and we have our limits and our, our, you know, everything kind of laid out and how we want to run the show, we still allow for this, those ranges and the flexibility when we don't get something done that we maybe wanted to get done. Or if a post was supposed to go out and we forgot and we call ourselves out all the time and just say, um, you know, this is experimental for us. <laughs> it's new and just own it. Right. So I like that these tools have that flexibility. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The beauty is that now the community is super, super global and it's very diverse, right? When we were starting mm -hmm. out, we were just begging our friends to test the tools out, <laughs> <laughs> to, to ask, are they actually working or are we imagine mm -hmm. now with hundreds and hundreds of people graduating from Reinvention Academy and most of our programs also available uh, through required element of all education we, we offer, which is you have to teach reinvention to others for free, you, for whatever, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But when we teach, we become masters. And this mm -hmm. also is a very humanitarian goals of bringing resilience and reinvention to billion of people, one billion mission that we have. So because of that, over 700,000 people have been touched and we can come back and listen to their stories. And sometimes the applications just startle me because I don't know, um, the very first time somebody worked with churches, reinventing churches, and I, what do I know? Churches were forbidden in Soviet Union. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, 
great, use the tools, I don't know. And it was very sweet to see that whether it's personal or professional, organizational or family unit as a system, whether it's one industry or another, corporate, nonprofit, for profit, a public sector, we've seen every application in the most surprising ways. And that's the freedom of community is when we all share and we get the alumni together at least once a year for an alumni gathering and they say what's working, what's not working. That gives us a lot of freedom to allow ourselves to experiment. I think when you see others experimenting, you're like, oh, I didn't know I can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we allow ourselves to be more free and experimental, we give others permission to do the same. Absolutely. It is freedom. It truly is freedom. Yeah. And I and just want to kind of backtrack to when we introduced you. Um, and we know a little bit about why you'd started reinvention or why it became an endeavor for you. But can you share with our listeners why, how reinvention started for you and why it became such an important endeavor? Of course. Um, I had an academic life and I had a luxury of getting to the peak of academic career. Anybody can hope for when you get a chaired professorship, which is a huge honor and you get a massive grant and a lot of freedom and a massive title. And my title and my grant came from Coca-Cola. Can you ask for a better sponsor for anything? <laughs> so I was the Coca-Cola chaired professor of strategy and sustainability. And I wrote books on systemic resilience and sustainability. And there was a conference, I want to say it was around 2012, um, because my daughter was just starting school, so she was seven or eight or so. And there were a lot of us after the conference as keynote speakers who were sitting at a dinner, um, very private dinner. And one of the people at the table looked at all of us and said, do you have hope? And you sit there, and as a scientist, we get accumulated data, uh, not even weekly, more than weekly. Most of the time, daily, you get whole bunch of data on the state of the affairs across economic, technological, social, geopolitical, environmental, um, so many different uh, systemic markers of the health of the systems. And if you look objectively at them, things are not looking good. So at that moment, most of us agreed that we as um, neutral observers of data believe that we passed the moment of prevention on most important disruptors that we will face in this century. That means most climate change damage will happen. It's too late. That means um, the domino effect that will lead to massive wars and conflicts over resources, first of all, water and the environmental migration where people cannot live on their native land anymore and the whole country needs to find a new place to live because there is no more water and you cannot grow food and that's already a must and that of course means economic reset political reset geopolitical reset equity and inclusion reset and so on and so forth and so i'm sitting there and i'm so proud of all the work we've done and you suddenly have to admit that it was a massive fail that we have not done a good job um, helping people prevent these things. And uh, with all our beautiful charts and massive books and better PowerPoints, it made zero difference. So I wanted to look at what was going on and it brought me back to my own home country and my own childhood and even early experiences because I come from a family of um, political dissidents. My country lived through tremendous disruption because about 100 years ago, um, we had the government of Soviet Union executing an artificial famine where 40% of all Kazakhs were murdered. And my family lived with that lineage. They were vocal opponents of the government. Uh, when my great-grandfather was executed as an enemy of the state, his son was in prison, tortured as a, um, as a person criticizing the regime. So it brought me back to this lived experience that ended up in the collapse of Soviet Union when I was coming of age. And it looked very similar, which is the 
experience of people who are living through disruption is all about fear of the unknown and incapacity, just no skills and no tools to live in the new world. So they would, because they don't have skills and tools, they rather hold on to the most horrific present, the most horrible present, than to try the new unknown future. The unknown, the fear of the unknown is so scary that they would rather literally live in a concentration camp because at least it's a familiar camp. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looked like with the uh, work in the science is that it's not that people were stupid, they were scared. So our attempt to convince them through data didn't work because they didn't need a better PowerPoint. Their problem is that they didn't, didn't have tools, they didn't have capacity to deal with the disruptions. And that's where the work started is, okay, how do we take the best examples of adaptability and reinvention how do we make it into a repeatable process? How do we create easy to understand fun tools? How do we start reframing the mindset? That's where the work began. It's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh about it because I don't know what else to do. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. There is no polite way to respond to, you know, all your family was killed and 40% of the population was murdered. It's it's uh, the reality of a lot of places on planet Earth, even right the second. So I think we as humanity are getting better. And at the same time, we as humanity have a massive opportunity now uh, in, in our hands to create a world where reinvention is everybody's birthright, where reinvention is a skill and a tool that is automatic as brushing our teeth. And when that is the case, then a disruption will not be used to scare us into submission. Disruption and turbulence will not be used to make us vote against our own best judgment and mm -hmm. on and on and on. When we, are, when we have that inner capacity to reinvent, it's very hard to scare someone or abuse someone or, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that is, uh, or start a war against others because your nation is scared of its own future. And that is the mission of Reinvention Academy and the global movement. You can find us on the following social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. It's such a noble mission. And as you said, you've already reached 700,000 people. And I know you've got a really vibrant community in South Africa. Yes. And I'm from Zimbabwe and I studied my bachelor's in South Africa. And what you were talking about data and the resource wars over, you know, agriculture and land and all that, I saw it in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's one of my reasons to emigrate to Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, coming back to what you said, another point that you said about there's been so much disruptions over the last 13 years, people think that it's going to stabilize. It's not going to stabilize. No. It's I thought, accelerating, right? Yeah. We have to look at data and be honest around it. So I will, uh, maybe you remember this from some of my recent publications, so play along. But those of you who are listening, uh, we look at disruption in different angles, and one of those is uh, Accenture's Global Disruption Index that is published every year. And recently, they were comparing uh, the last decade, so the years between 2011 2016, which is right post-recession, and the years of 2017 to 2022, which is the end of COVID. So five years post-recession and then five years uh, including COVID. Post-recession, the level of disruption across all types of disruption, economic, environmental, social, geopolitical, technological, consumer, all disruptions in a total index grew by 4%. In the late terms, that means on a typical week, you will have 4% more disruptions than five years before. Yeah, so you will get a random email, you will get something going wrong, you will get um, a customer or you will get a supplier saying, I cannot do things typically 4% more than five years before. What do you think is the growth between 17 and 2022? 4% before, what would be the number in the following five years? Hmm, I wanna say 6%. Okay, 
and you want gas. I'm just going to throw 20 out. Oh, I, God. I know. I just kind of go for it. Big number. Uh, so between 6 and 20, the actual number is 200%. Oh, my God. 200% of the actual wow. number. So if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel like everything is falling apart and all your plans are going out of the window, you are not crazy. Objectively, you're facing 200% more disruptions on a typical week than just five years ago. Hmm. You are not crazy. You are not tired. Oh, uh, you are not uh, crazy. You are not whatever else. <laughs> you are objectively facing more. Now, what does it mean? It means we need to build a reality in which that is expected. Hmm. It starts with very simple things, very simple things. For example, my team would get overwhelmed at the end of a week because as normal people, we plan out our week and then evenings and weekends, we deal with disruptions, right? They keep flying in and we cannot drop them. Hmm. Uh, our tech collapses or... Our customers are having something happening or whatever else is going on. So we would, as normal people, plan out our week. Yes, there's a little bit of wiggle room, but, you know, not 200% more <laughs> <laughs> wiggle room. After uh, a while, we said, well, we have to plan for disruptions. If this is now the new numbers, let's block out massive chunks of time throughout the week. That is our hold for disruption time. So mm. we know it's coming. We don't know what it is. We cannot mm -hmm. say what it will be on any given day, but we have time booked for that. So we are not booking ourselves into crazy, then working all evenings and weekends and then feeling like we're constantly playing catch up and firefighting. Let's plan for disruption. And that, again, is a dominant effect for every field we have to do strategy different because of this number we have to do career planning differently because of this number mm. we have to do everything different because of this number but it starts with looking at the truth looking at the facts and looking them as friendly facts not something out to get us but something that is here to serve us to help us come up with a new version of ourselves of our companies our communities Mm -hmm. So based on that 200% guess, increase, I'm just thinking to when, from the time you started the reinvention program, how, how many years has it been now since you started? Uh, the public programs we started in 2019, so it's only four years, but the okay. private programs, meaning what I taught in executive education, where I'm still a professor in a few schools, what I taught uh, to my clients, that's been... I want to say 15, 16, 16 years. Mm -hmm. And in the, that time frame, what are, what are some of the things that you've noticed in terms of how change is happening so much more rapidly, how people are dealing with turbulence and, and disruption and all those things? What are kind of, have you see, noticed a change for yourself and in the way you've approached the reinvention? Of course. So uh, first of all, we track um, we do our own global reinvention survey every two years. So we track the speed of change every two years and the adaptability and um, you know efficiency of reinvention every two years. And it's very noticeable that things are speeding up. So in the most uh, the fastest category, companies that are reinventing every 12 months or less, that means they're reinventing faster than their budgetary cycle. In that category, I can even open up the numbers. It was something like 8% a few years ago, and then it became something like 16%. And last year, that number I remember very well, it was 20.6%. That means every fifth company in the world is reinventing every 12 months or less. Mm -hmm. that might not be you, but your competitor is, is your uh -huh. supplier is, your uh, your customer might be reinventing faster than you are able to reinvent so they just move on anybody somebody every fifth company in the world is in your network is reinventing faster than you can possibly um think about the second thing that is very noticeable that if i think about my work 15 years ago i would spend 90 percent of time on the why of reinvention on showing the numbers convincing um, showing inspirational stories, la la, la. it was just <laughs> nonstop wire reinvention, and that's when the concept of Titanic syndrome was showed up is to speed up mm. the realization of the wire and make it fun and 
the theory of Titanic syndrome and then the tests and exercises around everything showed up then because that's all I was doing and I just I needed a more um, easy to understand vehicle and the story of Titanic and the parallels to business were just too, too good to miss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, um, so we went from why of reinvention was the first question, then the what of reinvention. So it was a lot of cases and stories and everyone was looking for a silver bullet. Like we find this one golden product and we are protected. By now, with the speed of reinvention accelerating, it, first of all, most people don't need the why. COVID took care of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we do. We just don't know. Uh, how the second in the what most companies are beginning to realize but it's still not fully there that the shelf life on any answer is very very short so if before you would find a golden product an amazing process an amazing market strategy and you would milk it for years and years and years now you find it you milk it in a few months somebody copied you it becomes irrelevant and the shelf life is so, so short that the obsession with the wow innovation story is nobody cares anymore because mm -hmm. it's compatible and it will be relevant. So now it's not the why, it's not the what, it's the how. And specifically, not a one-time reinvention, but the how on the process, diligent, thoughtful, easy process of reinvention that is systemic and repeatable. So, so the process is something people, I think, need to think about implementing into their their mindset, their business, their you know personal reinventions. Um, in the effort to you know stay with our theme of connection, I'm curious how people are using your reinvention methods and tools, or even amongst your own teams that you work with in your community, how it creates a better connection amongst the the teams and the people that work together. Well, the first of all, every single tool we employ uh, asks, asks you to look around and connect to somebody else. So you are asked to think about how connected you are to your environment and do you have a year to, a to the ground to anticipate change on time? Are you mm -hmm. connecting to your customers within your employees inside your family? Are you actually listening to what's going on? And are you getting ideas from new sources so you just created your own bubble and you are not exiting out of your bubble are you creating fresh quality connections to be able to hear what's going on before it's too late mm -hmm. same with every other tool so customer experience tool you have to go out and ask people what do they actually need the prioritization tools you have to have a conversation with your team or your family or whoever your client on what matters, what doesn't. So the tools are communal in nature because um, uh, thrivability is communal in nature. If one thing we know from the longest surviving system on the planet, which is the planet itself, nature, mm -hmm. look at how nature sustains itself in turbulence and it's seen massive turbulence in its life. Number one, it sustains itself by creating an ecosystem. It's never one species. It's never one thing surviving against all odds. We created this illusion by misunderstanding Darwin on survival of the fittest. The idea is survival of the fittest is the one that is physically or otherwise fit, right? It's the one who is the strongest and who can eat everyone else. And that is further from the truth. You, truth, if you look at the nature, nature actually regulates each other. So it's about fitting together, not mm -hmm. being fit, but fitting together in a way that creates uh, the goodness of the commons, the survival of the ecosystem. I mm -hmm. For this ecosystem. So if you are, and there have been plenty of reported uh, uh, examples of that, especially on islands, because islands are an isolated system. So you can really see what goes around when one species says, I am the fittest, I'm going to murder you all. What happens when one species goes out of control is um, everything collapses and that species first and foremost destroys itself. The mm -hmm. ecosystem will continue, but that species will never recover because it will first eat everything it can eat and then starve. 
there needs to be a balance between everyone and the food chain. And that is one of the biggest thing we as humanity have not yet grappled with, which is we are the only system on the planet that is currently not in check. And we have to come back to mm. not surviving of the fittest, being the strongest and the meanest bully on this planet, but being uh, a good harmonious fit into the ecosystem that thrives together. Mm -hmm. That makes me think of when I was living in Peru and I was teaching music at an international school there, and I had the huge fortune to go to Easter Island, uh, which is this yeah. island that is mm -hmm. the most distant from any other mainland in the world. And they have these huge stone heads called Moai, and basically, the people on that island uh, kept chopping down the trees to build these uh, spirits of their ancestors, the Moai, and transport them across the island. And they would have seen the last forest getting smaller and smaller and smaller until there was one tree left. And then huge malnourishment, many people dying one small disease, half of the population gone in one summer, you know, terrible, terrible. Yeah. And it's that's a perfect a typical, metaphor. Typical and very tragic example of what happens when one species or in a family, one person or in a company, one team starts behaving outside of a harmonious balance mm -hmm. and partnership and connection with the rest. Mm. When you go beyond the limits of what connection should allow you will not only destroy others first and foremost yes they destroy the trees but they didn't destroy the ecosystem the island is still there the birds and other species are still there humans are not so whenever we talk about environmental issues for example and everyone says about you know let's save the whales and the monkeys and let's save nature i have to remind nature will be here we won't the issue mm -hmm. whether nature will survive, it will. It's been here long before us, and it's been here long after many other species. The question is not, um, you know, survival of nature. It's will we survive doing what we are doing to nature? Because nature will mm -hmm. produce other, uh, other species. And if you don't believe that, look at the scientific data. Monkeys have entered the Stone Age quite a few years ago. So we have a backup plan. There's a next one. <laughs> They're starting. <laughs> so there is never there is never an empty spot in nature. Don't worry, it will fill it up. It's us who is threatened. And it's mm. self-interest, the uh, communal interest, the connecting interest, the connections between us, it's a self-interest. Mm. I love that answer. I love the tie into nature. And my, I think one of my favorite parts of the program was the biomimicry piece, just because I'm such a nature freak. So <laughs> I, I really appreciate that component. And for those that don't know what biomimicry is, do you want to share a little bit about how you use that? Yeah. Uh, so I do invite you to check out just Google biomimicry and you will immediately see a beautiful TED talk by Junine Benyus, who is mm -hmm. really the face who popularized the movement. The essence is very simple. Uh, nature has figured out a lot of the challenges we humans have not yet even approached. So if you look at the strength of a typical spider web uh, in terms of the lightness of the web compared to the weight it holds, none of the fabrics humans ever produced have that level of strength. So mm -hmm. we can learn from spiders how to do textiles. We already borrowed a lot of our best products. For, the, for example, Velcro was mm -hmm. inspired by a particular uh, burrs. particular type of a plant. They're like I burrs. That so stick I, to yeah. You. yeah, yeah. And then it, it, they physically mimic exactly uh, mm -hmm. the, the endings of the flower. So uh, biomimicry, thankfully now, is not only used in product development, but also process and team development, because nature also knows how to cooperate in teams, how to connect and listen to each other, how to solve conflicts. If you ever planted anything with multiple different plants, look at how they solve conflict. So you can really, really borrow a lot and mimic mm, biology. Mm -hmm. That's where biomimicry comes from. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I'd like to know from you, Nadia, what is, um, you know, what is something you wish that 
at people asked you, like, you know, we we have you, we ask you our questions. I'm sure you've been on many, many podcasts. You've been in through tons of interviews. But is there anything that you wish, like, one interviewer or somebody would ask you that you could share with listeners? Oh, it changes every day. <laughs> it's a good know, answer. <laughs> I know. Um, I remember we talked about it, and I filled out. I had an idea and now I don't because I think it depends on the day. Today, it's, you know, we're recording this in September 2023. We are um, three and a half years since the pandemic. We are again waiting for the recession. We have a number of hot spots on planet Earth, not just the Ukrainian war. We just had a massive flood in Libya and a horrible earthquake. Uh, in Morocco, I think the questions that I am grappling with, that I'm hoping we all ponder, not just I answer, is what is what is this time calling us for? What is this time calling us to do? What's the call of our time? And that mm -hmm. call is personal. But I do think every generation has a call. And I wonder what is our call? Hmm. I do think the beauty of this turbulent world is a permission to let go of things that no longer serve us. And the question is, what are we wanting, what are we willing to let go and what we've been waiting to let go, never giving ourselves permission to? It's time to let go. It can be relationships, products, services, jobs, markets, whatever. But also once we get rid of that weight, then what's the call of our time? And as every time I enter the news and ask myself, what's the call of my time? What is one mm -hmm. thing that makes it meaningful and makes it relevant and makes it worthwhile? And that that is that is a question for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been pondering that same thing, I think, mm -hmm. recently. As you said, we do live in very turbulent times right now. So I think this, this was an extremely valuable conversation. I can't wait for our listeners to hear this episode. Um, I'm going to let Quentin ask you the question we like to ask everyone on the show before we wrap it up. Yeah. So our question is, what does connection mean to you? You asked me that question when we were warming up um, <laughs> yeah. weeks ago, and I answered something, and I have no clue. But I, I want to say what connection means to me right the second. My parents were here for two weeks, and I took them to the airport yesterday. And um, they lived through horrific lives. If I look at their lives, there's so much there that I have no clue how they candled. I really mm. don't know. Um, my parents graduated from college. It's a government college because everything in Soviet Union was government owned. And you get a ticket and you're assigned to a city and a job. And if you don't take it, you go to prison because you are not legally allowed. It's illegal to be unemployed. And really, that's it. And they were telling the stories to my daughter, who is 19 and in college, just so she can see that even when you are living in um, decades of hopelessness and you cannot leave that country and there is, other than suicide, there is no exit route, that even when you live in the decades of hopelessness and even if you may not ever make it to the moment where it got better, like it happened for my grandfather who ended up killing himself in the 70s, when you look at the generation you have a connection to the future that is well, well beyond anything you can control. Because now I have a daughter who is walking around in the United States doing whatever heck she wants, building communities, creating possibilities, only because somebody 50, 60, 70 years ago didn't give up and mm. didn't, didn't give in. And for me today, connection is the intergenerational cross country, cross faith, cross industry, cross political system, web of life that can hold us together and bring us closer to each other. So that's where I am today. But you ask me in a couple <laughs> of weeks, it may be something else. 
That's, uh, yeah, um, an amazing answer from an amazing guest today. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, I'd like to let our listeners know where they can get a hold of you. And please uh, mention your reinvention lab that's upcoming. Of course. So, of course, grab a copy of our uh, book preview, the Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook. You can always find more resources, including that book, on our website, learn to reinvent.com. The two is a number there. So learn number to reinvent.com. And on the same page, you will always find an invitation to the Easy Reinvention Lab. This is a community event that we hold for free every few months. We try to do for a year. And it's literally about Southern people from all over the world who come together and everyone chooses whatever they want to reinvent. So the process is the same. The focus can be different every time. That's what Quentin was talking about, that you come second time, not because the tools are different, because you are different, because mm -hmm. are different, because your focus is different, because your priority is different. But you learn the tools, and after a few rounds, you actually start beat, beating differently. You build them into your life. And then they become your armor against turbulence and disruption and they lift you up. So we are happy to see you at the lab. We're happy to um, share our resources. We have tons of free downloads. So learn to reinvent.com and you will see more from there. Amazing. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, for sharing all of these very, very heartfelt, vulnerable stories about yourself, your past, your rise in corporate and now taking reinvention to a billion people. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nadia, for being here. We appreciate you. My pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>